My name is LaShondra Price. I am Chief of the Health Inequities and Global Health Branch at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and I'd like to welcome you to the seventh lecture of the Genomics and Health Disparities Lecture Series. This series is a part of an ongoing dialogue about how innovations in genomics research and technology can impact health disparities. In addition to NHLBI, the series is co-sponsored by four other partners, the National Human Genome Research Institute, the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Diseases, and the, the Office of Minority Health at the Food and Drug Administration. Speakers have been chosen by these five organizations to present their research on the ability of genomics to improve health for all populations. The speakers in the series approach the problem from different areas of research, including basic science, population genomics, and translational and clinical research. We are honored today to have Dr. Herman Taylor, Jr. as our speaker. Dr. Taylor is an endowed professor and director of the Cardiovascular Research Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine and a nationally recognized cardiologist. His current research predominantly focuses on preventive cardiology, and his teaching is aimed at building research capacity at minority-serving institutions and enhancing the health of minority communities through research and health activism at the community level. Dr. Taylor may be most well-known for his leadership of the Jackson Heart Study, the largest community-based study of cardiovascular disease among African Americans, funded by two of our sponsoring institutes today, NHLBI and NIMHD. His extensive experience uh, in epidemiological observation has led him to a deeper appreciation of the urgency of community level intervention as a priority, as well as a keen interest in broadening the diversity of disciplines and scientists focused on the problem of health disparities nationally and globally. A graduate of Princeton University, Taylor earned his medical degree from Harvard Medical School, trained in internal medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, my alma mater, and completed a cardiology fellowship at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Please help me welcome Dr. Herman Taylor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a, a great pleasure to be here with you. I'd like to um, begin my remarks with a brief story. After leaving the Jackson Heart Study and relocating to Atlanta and Morehouse School of Medicine, one of the first people I met was a gentleman who uh, somewhat aggressively called me um, and uh, got me on the phone with my, my new assistant, let him through uh, by phone. And he, uh, he said, uh, uh, Dr. Taylor, um, you know, I'm interested in your work. I'm, I've followed your career, and I'd like to uh, hear more about um, some of the things that you're interested in. Could I come over? I said, why, well, certainly. And he made an appointment. So the day came, and in walks this gentleman. Um, he... Um, is, is gray-haired um, and, and looked a little different than I expected from the vigor in his voice. Um, he handed me a sheet of paper, and it gave his most recent physical exam. And it, showed, and it said, this man uh, appears younger than his stated age. He uh, is about 140 pounds, about five foot six. Um, he uh, has a, a normal, normal vital signs. Uh, and his phys physical exam is normal, although he does complain occasionally of a little bit of hip pain. His labs were entirely normal, except for creatinine of 1.3. Um, and everything else was unremarkable. It was a clean bill of health. Um, I looked at the gentleman. I asked him how old he was. Uh, he, I'll tell you later. That's the punchline. Uh, but he, he, cut, he cut the visit short because he had to be on his way. He had to go and visit a friend of his who was his uh, sergeant in World War II, uh, who was ailing. This gentleman was 92 years old. His friend was 101. Both of them were African American. Now, why do I tell you that story? Um, I'll briefly today just point out to you that heterogeneity 
is an important concept to keep in mind when we're talking about African Americans and their health. There has been a huge and important emphasis on disease and death as being excessive and premature among African Americans. However, there is, that is an incomplete story. And I want to offer that we today briefly consider three dimensions of health disparities, race, risk, and resilience. American race-based health disparities, as you all know, are real, pervasive, and quite persistent. The last 30 years has given us really a very important era and a deluge of literature that has outlined the, um, well, given us the outlines of this problem and made it uh, indisputably a fact of uh, how we view American health. <coughs> Group comparisons are often the way that we dramatize the disparities. Um, they're useful, but they may contribute to a monolithically negative view of black health, and I think obscuring some opportunities. Black resilience is overlooked, and I believe that its study may offer fresh insights. This is a slide that all of the cardiologists and cardiovascular research people are overly familiar with. That is that heart disease is a problem. It is the number one killer. It has been so for a long time, despite the fact that there has been a dramatic <coughs> decline over the last uh, half century and more in the deaths from cardiovascular disease. Some of that owing to possibly some of these uh, landmark uh, 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 labelings, this annotation uh, up and down, uh, up, uh, below and be above and below this uh, line showing the trend. I won't go into each of these, but these are important advances along the way that uh, Betsy Nabel and uh, Eugene Brownwall put together a few years back. Of course, that dramatic improvement in the public's health with regard to cardiovascular disease uh, has uh, another side to it, and that is the fact that over that time, there has been an increasingly um, evident and, dis and uh, discouraging disparity that's emerged. Even though black and white have seen improvements, the gap is there and widening. And uh, all of this really led to an important effort on the part of uh, then um, HHS uh, Secretary uh, uh, Heckler to call for um, the, uh, to call, call together a work, working group, to, a task force rather, to put together this landmark report. I think most of you are probably familiar with this. And it really did usher in an era of uh, seminal discovery and, um, and publications that again, let the world know about the disparities in no uncertain terms. And that approach has been, again, very, very fruitful. It's taught us things about excess deaths, among blacks and other groups, access inequities of a variety of sorts, risk factor differences that pertain, uh, that obtain in both groups, the potency, the great potency of social determinants of health. And a lot of this has uh, led to the desire to uh, get more granular data on the underpinnings of a persistent epidemic among African Americans. Um, and I was pleased to be part of a major effort to get more granular detail on uh, the African American um, health experience with regards to heart, heart disease and diseases of the circulation called the Jackson Heart Study. Um, a great idea to look in Framingham style at a population of African Americans living in the Deep South and to try to, again, get, at, get to the bottom of the underpinnings of a persistent epidemic. Great idea, but um, not something that was easily accomplished. Uh, just briefly about the Jackson Heart Study, there was um, not uh, overwhelming uh, embrace of the study at first. Um, as you can see, here were some of the um, attitudes uh, that we confronted when we began. When we, get, we began polling people back in 1998 before the start of the study in 2000. During that two-year interim period, there were a lot of meetings, a lot of interaction with the uh, population, a lot of surveys, focus groups, and the developing of an approach 
that um, is in large measure the community-based participatory approach, uh, which I think was in fact the key to us being able to pull the uh, Jackson Heart Study off. Um, I mean, consider for a moment. Um, Jackson is, what, 200 plus miles from Tuskegee, where some bad, bad things happened that were in the memory of the people that we wanted to be a part of this, a part of this study. Um, and um, beyond that, in 1998, there was a new movie called Miss Evers Boys, uh, starring Lawrence Fishburne and Alfre Woodard, that dramatized um, this whole thing. That same year, President Clinton apologized for Tuskegee. So Tuskegee was very much front of mind for black Southerners who were being asked the question, um, we're here from the government, essentially, and we want to do a study just on black people. Uh, are you ready for that? Um, <clears throat> so it, it, it was something that we had to grapple with. And thanks to uh, a community that was in part motivated by this steady drumbeat of bad news about black health, uh, it was their acceptance and building trust among them, uh, which was led by our approach of involving them from the ground floor uh, that led to the success of the Jackson Heart Study, which, as I think you know, is still going forward today. Here are some members of that community that uh, we are forever grateful to. Um, and granular indeed. So we got uh, a lot of information and we've created uh, perhaps the most uh, thoroughly phenotyped group of African Americans that you can find. And um, th uh, the Jackson Heart Study remains, as a brief aside, very collaborative and anxious to work with people who are bringing good ideas uh, for analysis of the comprehensive data set. Uh, that's just one of the high tech things that's available, that is MRI studies. Uh, everything from simple analyses and comparisons like obesity in Framingham versus Jackson, which led to perhaps the not surprising observation that in stage two obesity, there's a, the prevalence is three times as great among African Americans in Jackson as whites in Framingham. And stage one, there's double the prevalence and only one third of the population being in the normal BMI in Jackson versus a Framingham standard. Um, from those simple types of analysis to much more complex uh, opportunities to, anal to uh, analyze um, uh, advanced uh, variables such as left ventricular strain from MRI and uh, a host of other uh, things that um, I think are unique, unique in all of epidemiology. All of this and more there's not time to go in depth into the Jackson Heart Study and its uh, database, but um, we are still, um, importantly, I think, focused on risk. This is one of the uh, important recent papers to come out that talks about risk profiling, which represents, again, a positive piece of progress in that novel biomarkers and subclinical disease measures were employed to get a more refined uh, pre prediction um, equation on the probability of an African American developing a significant cardiovascular disease that came out of uh, a lot, uh, looking at a lot of the variables out of the Jackson Heart Study, but we still are looking at risk. And I think looking at risk again, while valuable, misses an opportunity. So group comparisons, when you look at black versus white, you keep getting this, um, this story of whites up here, blacks down here. But those comparisons obscure successes within the African-American population. They obscure stories like uh, the gentleman I opened up the story with, and opened up the lecture with, and you know, I, uh, obviously that's anecdotal, but I, I challenge you to ask any uh, person of African-American descent uh, uh, about this and whether or not they know people like this. We all do. Uh, a lot of us see them in the front row at church on Sunday morning. Um, it is not an unusual phenomenon. Now, they themselves, the 100-year-olds and the vigorous 90-year-olds may be outliers, but they're there and they're there, I think, to teach us something. So 
when instead of thinking of blackness as badness when it comes to health, uh, note the facts. Yes, 50% of African Americans uh, above the age of 21 have hypertension. That's not good. That's bad. But 50% don't. And many people um, suggest that uh, given the stresses and strains of uh, African American life, that that number might be higher. You can imagine that. 85% of uh, blacks don't have heart disease, while way too many do, substantial number don't. And, it, and I think most of you are aware of the interesting phenomenon that if blacks and whites reach an age of, say, 79 or 80, that African Americans are at least as likely to live a long life and often outlive their white counterparts, contrary to prevailing notions of black infirmity. Resilience, I think, to use a word, uh, is an important idea that we need to look at in the African American context. Health maintenance in the face of risk that for some African Americans is overwhelming and, it, and contributes to a deterioration in health and poor health statistics, but in others is not the factor. In fact, they overcome it and do well. Understanding the environmental individual promoters, promoters of cardiovascular health within the black population is vastly understudied and I think important for blacks, important for health disparities, but important beyond African Americans because we have this ongoing 300 year, if you will, um, experiment uh, in um, social marginalization, deprivation, discrimination. These are facts of American history. We have that as a chronic stressor, but despite that, even today, there are African Americans who are 100 years old, happy, and vigorous. What is the key to that? Now, resilience obviously is not a new idea. It has its roots in uh, medicine and social sciences in developmental psychology uh, uh, literature, where it was noted many years ago that despite children having traumatic experiences, stressful adversities in their youth, the phenomenon of some of them not only maintaining and doing well, but some of them truly thriving has been observed over and over. That notion of resilience um, is usually spoken of in terms and measured in terms like the ones you see listed at these various levels. Uh, on the community level, social capital, for instance, the fam uh, family level and social unit, teamwork, reduced stigma. On the individual level, things like mastery and even optimism. But the phenomenon of resilience is obviously noted in a, a variety of contexts uh, with a, a nod to Dr. Hannah Valentine. Um, we see in, in, in uh, diseases like peripartum cardiomyopathy, you know, why is it that some of the women who go through that terrible ordeal actually recover quite well, as in this case, a woman whose uh, ejection fraction dropped to 28%, recovered to 66%, while others receiving similar care do not, and they go on to heart transplantation, heart failure and heart transplantation. And um, even beneath the organ level, the notion, uh, and this is taken from the toxicology literature, of cellular resi resilience, that is a cell exposed to, say, the, the, uh, the LD50, that dose of a toxin that kills half the cells in a dish. Well, that other half lives. What, what happened? What distinguishes one from the other, one population of cells from the other? Um, here, uh, it's described in terms of starting with a baseline, a naive cell, uh, having the cell undergo a stress, in, in this model a toxin, uh, sets the cell off on basically one of two major pathways, a pathway of defense, where, which could result in recovery and healing, or even uh, increased vigor, sort of increased toughness for this cell, robustness, it says in this particular slide, or a pathway of toxicity, where the uh, stressful event uh, led to negative um, epigenetic imprinting, let's say, and 
put the cell on a pathway of um, long-term adverse outcome or a much more immediate uh, negative outcome. So resilience on these levels, I think, needs to be a thought, a consideration, a construct that we embrace more fully. Um, again, the pattern naive, stress, result. Now, a natural thought is, well, you know, if we just get rid of all risks or study risks and just redu reduce those, won't that result in uh, optimal health? Well, I think it's important for us to study risk and understand risk in the African American population. But it's also important to understand that risk doesn't tell us everything about what the phenomena we see that we, that we um, use or that we understand to describe or characterize African American health, particularly cardiovascular health. Here's just a couple of points. Um, factors that should reduce risk often don't appear to in the literature. So uh, very often it's noted that blacks don't receive the same cardiovascular benefits from a high socioeconomic status, that great equalizer in most folks' eyes, uh, than whites. Um, social support has been noted by my, my psychology colleagues as not always as protective as it appears in whites. Um, some factors that should increase risk don't appear to. Some of the best outcomes in this study uh, around uh, the South led by uh, Dr. George Rust, formerly of Morehouse School of Medicine, some of his best health outcomes were noted in the poorest of areas. Contextual factors that are protective in the North may be less protective in the South. There's all of this, again, heterogeneity that we don't fully understand and therefore can't fully exploit. When we look at the sum total of the literature, we actually don't know a lot about the factors that promote resilience among blacks, and that's an important omission. We feel that uh, Atlanta offers a particularly good opportunity um, in terms of exploring these problems because Atlanta is an example of, a, of an American city where there is great um, heterogeneity among its, among its population. I mean, we've got people who obviously are down and out, uh, even to the point of homelessness, and then you've got Tyler Perry. You've got, and everybody in between. Um, the point being that there is a lot of black affluence in Atlanta. There's also black poverty. There's a lot of other diversity in terms of immigrant populations who are black. And there's a wide range, as you, I'll show you in a second, of cardiovascular health profiles that uh, are represented in a place like Atlanta. Not that it's the only place, but it's an ideal place. And as a lot of uh, you know, it's been called the black mecca of the South. Some DC natives might object to that, but uh, that's what Ebony Magazine says, so it must be true. <laughs> and uh, with an eye towards that opportunity, we formed something that we called Mecca, and I teamed up with some colleagues at Emory, and uh, of course my colleagues in the Cardiovascular Research Institute, and across Morehouse School of Medicine to form the Morehouse Emory Cardiovascular Center for Health Equity. Health Equity is, I think most of you know, is in the DNA of Morehouse School of Medicine and is what we live and breathe there. And think back to that naive stress result model. Um, in disparities research, we posit that Black race equals risk. Now that sounds pretty dramatic when it's just said as a standalone statement. But I think all of you would agree that you read paper after paper that has this in the conclusion, the words like this. Independent of traditional risk factors, African American individuals have a two to three times uh, increased risk in whatever is bad in that paper, right? Um, even after adjusting for relevant, potentially confounding variables, and so on. I mean, it's been a steady drumbeat, right? So black race equals risk in a lot of the literature that we read and consume every single day. Well, we wanted to look at this idea of resilience after the chronic or 
um, while being chronically exposed to those aspects of being black that result in high risk and high cardiovascular risk in particular. And we're, we're beginning to um, look at not only um, sort of a global uh, impression, but we're looking at three uh, distinct levels. Um, the contextual level, that is, and we call it our population project, where we're looking at neighborhood context and at, using the best instruments available to us. Um, that'll include an objective and a subjective assessment of the environment. Objective limited by um, the data we're able to get from uh, various uh, databases. And subjective coming from this population of about 1,500 people that we've uh, interviewed uh, by phone about the subjective uh, experience of living where they live. Not in their county, but down to the census tract level so we get as much of a microcosm of life as we can. Um, and then the individual level, which actually has two levels, and we're calling, that the, calling these the clinical and the basic projects. We're looking at <coughs> psychosocial and behavioral aspects through interviews and using standardized instrumentation to assess these, uh, these uh, dimensions. And also, we're attempting to get a look at the vascular and epigenetic, epigenetic fingerprints, if you will, of resilience by looking at people who evidence resilience by our definition and those who don't, those who come from positive environments and those that are less positive. Okay, so the aim of the first project, the uh, population project, again, compare, um, we're trying to paint a picture. We're trying to uh, find those uh, micro environments that are particularly uh, hazardous, if you will, from a, a cardiovascular standpoint. So we're going to compare uh, what we can, CV hospitalizations, emergency department <coughs> visits, and deaths among blacks across these communities across Atlanta. Um, and the second aim is to elucidate factors that contribute to the community's uh, cardiovascular resilience and risk at both the census, census tract and, and eventually the individual level, and examine relationships between resilience and some of the standard risk factor scores. So this is what it looks like uh, overall. There are 940 census tracts, a lot of census tracts in Atlanta, and we're going to try to distinguish uh, the at-risk and resilient. Um, that's the geographic spread. Uh, Atlanta is eventually is going to be all of North Georgia, but this is Atlanta right now. Um, and in that red, we're going to, again, look at uh, select census tracts that meet the criteria we want. Now, <clears throat> this is how it looked. These, these census tracts with enough African Americans to allow the calculation of the rates that we used to determine whether they are at risk or resilient. And, you know, it's interesting to see that sometimes they're right next door to each other. The, uh, the ones with bad uh, CVD health statistics and the ones with great CVD health statistics. So we had these to choose from, and what we did was select um, those, um, uh, we selected a subset of these census tracts that, uh, a subset of about 214, I'm sorry, 224, that despite having similar, highly similar median black incomes, because we know SES and income is a powerful predictor of positive uh, cardiovascular health. Um, but we wanted to take that out of the mix because I think we know the answer there in the sense that income is irrefutably important. We wanted to know what else was operative. And <clears throat> um, so you see here median incomes that are very close, but these uh, census tracts had dramatically different mortality rates in terms of cardiovascular disease. You see here nearly twofold, um, uh, dramatically increased uh, dependence on uh, um, uh, emergency department uh, for health care, and the hospitalization rate for cardiovascular diagnosis was dramatically higher in the at-risk uh, population. So we're very early in the data collecting and analysis, uh, but this just shows us that we can construct such a comparison. And the early, the early results from looking at the early data suggest that census tracts across Metro Atlanta have variable rates of premature CVD. I think I showed you that pictorially. 
Uh, and this, vari this variation exists even when median black household income is taken into account. And we find both types of tracks. Aim two was to look at maybe what in the context may be related to these differences. Okay, now, admittedly, we have to use somewhat blunt instruments to look at this, but I think it begins to help us uh, tell a story. So with the population survey, which was 1,500 people that uh, we did by phone with all of the challenges and limitations of that, uh, we would gather impressions subjectively of the neighborhood environments in these two types of uh, communities. And we wanted to gather through, again, phone administered instruments, health, mental health, health behavior, social information from the residents in the two types of tracts. And of course, compare outcomes in both. And to sum up the early preliminary data on this, again, intriguing, um, perhaps controversial, thought provoking, um, what has turned out to be not significant in these particular tracks is the uh, walking environment, the ability to uh, get out and walk to where you needed to go and, um, and uh, exercise almost passively by doing so. Activities with the neighbors, that whole idea of cohesion and community uh, somehow being healthful for cardiovascular health was not evident in our data so far. Okay. And I'm caveating this heavily because it is early. And walkable grocery stores, interestingly, was not, did not fall out in early analysis as a significant community um, characteristic in terms of cardiovascular health. In the people that did get on the phone with us, um, there was a significant difference in global health in these different communities where the median income was almost identical, right? But you had this vast difference in cardiovascular health parameters that we measured. We saw that their impressions of their global health were distinctly better in the resilient neighborhoods. The uh, evidence of depression using standard epidemiological uh, depressive symptom scoring techniques, um, there was a significant difference. Um, and the, the more positive being in the resilient neighborhoods. And levels of optimism were distinctly more evident in the resilient neighborhoods. This is just looking at the depression uh, scores of percent uh, using a cut point of 16 in the CESD, looking at the different percentages in, and this was a significant difference. Looking more, uh, now, so that's where we are with the context. So some interesting findings, and again, preliminary. Our next project, which is actually beginning to run simultaneously, we're, we're recruiting for this and enrolling in it now, uh, is to look at uh, more uh, individual characteristics, including um, looking at biomarkers of inflammation, such as CRP, oxidative stress, regenerative capacity, vascular measures, non-invasive, simple vascular measures to look at the um, condition, if you will, of the, uh, the uh, vasculature in these individuals and whether there's some subclinical uh, uh, disease that, that comes out as being more evident in, one, in people from one context versus the other. And, um, and all of these uh, 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 markers will be adjusted for the Life Simple 7 score. So we're going to, again, look at at-risk and, and resilient communities and march them through a protocol which will help us identify whether or not there are individual characteristics that uh, might be um, evident from people coming from those environments. And <clears throat> the, this project flows into the next project three, which I'll show you in a second, which looks at um, uh, epigenetic and uh, metabolomic uh, parameters that may also be flowing with the risk that people are experiencing either in their communities um, or at another level, at an individual level that we don't fully assess until we get them into the clinic. And these particular biomarkers were chosen based on some preliminary work by members of our group um, that looked at survival after myocardial infarction. So clearly survival here 
um, in, uh, in red where the, the oxidative stress and inflammation score was significantly higher, was dramatically poorer for people who, had, who evidenced high levels of oxidative stress and inflammation. Similarly, with low regenerative capacity, the um, post-myocardial infarction mortality was significantly higher. And in, in an interesting study, um, uh, we saw that neighborhood effects, different neighborhoods, actually, if you drew blood and looked at it from people who were in different types of neighborhoods, poor versus not so poor, this is a different study, but what it showed was that you actually had different levels of these inflammatory cytokines de depending on neighborhood characteristics such as environment, walkability, which seems to contrast with what I just told you from our current study, and neighborhood cohesion. Again, that seems also to contradict that. So, but these were candidate um, things to measure because of preliminary data from other studies. And finally, we will take these people from resilient and non-resilient environments and we'll um, randomize them into um, an intervention which will be aimed specifically at altering their risk in, um, in more um, traditional risk factors. So we'll be aiming at things like blood pressure, cholesterol level, and so on, and physical activity with this intervention to see the before and the after, to see um, if there is any, any change in any of the biomarkers that we have um, decided to investigate based on preliminary data from other studies. And the basic project, which is going to look at, um, again, beneath the cellular level, we will be looking at uh, microRNA patterns that may be tied to cardiovascular health or disease. We'll be taking the microRNA data, combining it, combining it with uh, metabolomic analyses done uh, at, at Emory, uh, where um, uh, Dr. Dean Jones has the capability to um, measure over 20,000 chemicals in human serum. That will give us insight into all types of exposure and all types of metabolic activity. That information plus the microRNA information will ideally give us some view on a subcellular level of who the, who the resilient people, again, by our definition, are, who the non-resilient are, and whether or not a change happens with intervention. So this is admittedly very exploratory, a first step in looking into the notion of resilience at the contextual level, at an individual sort of whole body level, and a subcellular level. Some other studies that are going on uh, in the Cardiovascular Research Institute related to the same idea include uh, a very interesting um, rat study that looks at um, a rat model for um, uh, stress and PTSD. And uh, it's a very interesting idea in that you take a, um, a rat here and you expose them repeatedly to a bigger, more aggressive species, right, over and over. And um, some of the rats will develop the rat equivalent of PTSD, which is uh, social avoidance. Now, the, the, the rat scientists may correct some of what I say here. But that is the basic idea. So you have, this is the aggressor, um, and this, this mouse has been traumatized by continual exposure to, to rats that are that size, that level of aggression over and over and over. And when you put them, although the, this rat is caged, you see a very unnatural response from a very social animal. He's turned away and he's avoiding. Same exposures, but this guy um, has not learned this behavior has not um, developed social avoidance and um, uh, in a way has not developed the post-traumatic distress that this one has. Uh, doc, our postdoc, Dr. Chloe Gray, is looking at what distinguishes these two mice 
on uh, a molecular level and what interventions might um, uh, reduce the uh, frequency of the development of this phenotype as a model for addressing resilience uh, with um, targeted therapy. Uh, we're also looking um, at angiogenesis as a mechanism of resil resilience. Already, one of the microRNAs that um, has been isolated at, uh, and uh, among African Americans and whites derived from stored samples uh, has been shown to incite um, if if it is if the um, if endothelial cells uh, overexpress that particular microRNA, it's found that um, angiogenesis, uh, a robust angiogenesis, is induced by that microRNA. One, another one of our postdocs is uh, pursuing that line of investigation to see whether or not this could be a mechanism of a sort of resilience, particularly in the context of diseases like myocardial infarction and heart failure. And finally, another study to look at the health disparities even before, with the idea being that we can look for indicators of health disparities before they emerge by studying the young. We're looking at um, uh, mobile health cohort studies that will allow us to enroll young people, right now between the ages of 18 and 29, in a study that will allow the gathering of granular, real-time um, as some would suggest, in the wild data. that doesn't require people to come into a, a clinic for examination or come into a hospital, but rather uh, important information on things like sleep, physical activity, um, uh, mental state, um, and, um, and, and other things that can be um, obtained with the wearing of um, wearable sensors uh, to see what some of the early indicators of the emergence of uh, disparities might be. So, what am I saying? Over the years, even before the Heckler Report, it's been observed by really even the most casual observer, but, um, but among those of us who think deeply about social conditions and health, uh, people like uh, W.B. Du Bois. It's been observed that the African American experience is quite unique and has been for the better part of three centuries. Um, here's his quote: "One thing we must, of course, expect to find, and that is a and that is a much higher death rate present among Negroes than whites. They have in the past lived under vastly different conditions, and they still do." That was 1899. I think this remains a fairly true statement. There has been, of course, there have been many advances. But I think if we were to freeze frame today, that statement would not seem um, very uh, radical in 2017. What I'm inviting, however, is for us to embrace this notion of disparities and continue to work on every possible front to resolve them, social determinants of health, making those uh, less of an issue, uh, access to care, all of those things have to be pounded on continually. But I do want to introduce the notion that if we look past the great successes within the African American population, people who are living well today, despite it all, people who have grown up uh, through the teeth of some of the worst uh, conditions in, uh, in terms of social inequities, people who were there for all of those uh, atrocities, all of those terrible things that happened in the 50s, 60s, who are still with us. How do they do it? They are, I mean, it's, they're, they're right in plain sight. And I think what they offer is a new way to think about what we can do in the present time to help African Americans and others who suffer uh, under the burden of health disparities. I think, again, historically, we've been here focusing on unique vulnerabilities. A singular emphasis on risk and poor outcomes neglects 
understanding of assets and positive as aspects of black health, recognition of heterogeneity and resilience in the face of adversity, I think promotes a complementary and positive pathway towards the resolution of health disparities. And frankly, I think your patients grow tired of hearing nothing but bad news. They get a little weary of hearing that, you know, black equated, of hearing black equated with negative or poor outcomes, because that's not the whole story. I think as we talk to our students to our, and to our patients, to our colleagues about disparities and how um, blacks have had problems derived from that, I think we owe it to the black population, we owe it to our colleagues and, and students, and, and we owe it, I think, to the progress of science to simultaneously acknowledge that the general arc of blacks in North America has been one of survival that they have overcome, to, in, in the words of the anthem of the 60s, in many ways they have overcome, many, many of them. And that's something worth studying and understanding. I'll close with this. <clears throat> How many of you remember the song, Spanish Harlem? There's a rose in Spanish Harlem. Anybody old enough to? <laughs> no one will admit it. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, Ben Hill, the same guy who did Stand By Me, and also Aretha Franklin later re-recorded it. And there's a line in that song um, that I think is worth remembering. At, at the lyrical highlight of the song, uh, ben says, uh, <clears throat> she's, um, well, it's about a beautiful young lady who's living in the midst of poverty. He says, <clears throat> she's growing up in the street, right through the concrete. I think it's important for us to remember that for many African Americans, life has been as hard as concrete, but they've come through. What is that trying to tell us as a scientific community? These are not just anecdotes. These are facts of life that demand explanation. And my challenge to, to you um, and to me is to understand this more deeply as a positive pathway towards resolving health disparities. Thank you. So we have time for questions. If you will just proceed to the microphone on either side. Hi, Hi. I, I you? enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, did you look at the percentage of the population who were black in each of the census tracts, and did that correlate with anything? Yes. Um, so, thank you for that question. We did, um, and in terms of, um, in most instances. Um, the higher the percentage of non-blacks in the population, the higher the median income, and the more positive the parameters for cardiovascular uh, disease, right? Fewer hospitalizations, fewer uh, ED visits, et cetera. Um, again, I, you know, we are still uh, looking at that data, and I hope I'll be invited back to give you a much more comprehensive review of it. But um, your, your question's an important one, and, and we're, we're going to continue doing analysis on that. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Dr. Taylor. Tiffany Hello. Powell Wiley from uh, NHLBI. <laughs> it's that good was to see you. You yeah. as well. It was an excellent talk, uh, very um, uh, inspirational in thinking more about the way we look more positively um, at the African American community. Um, just two quick questions. Did, do you all look at uh, perceived environment in addition to built environment measures? And also, are you looking at measures that look at um, experiences across a life course to really get at what right. those differences may right. be? I mean, excellent questions. Um, this is uh, American Heart Association funding, which is <laughs> good. It's good money. Uh, but it only takes us so far. Um, in terms of looking at the subjective um, uh, impressions, Everything I showed you was self-report at this point. Um, uh, and 
it really does reflect how people view, the data I showed today, really does reflect how people view their environment. And um, we, we'll have to do more work in terms of what objective things we can find out about mm -hmm. it in terms of things like air pollution and, mm -hmm. and those things that are not so much uh, subject to interpretation. Okay. And then as far as life course measures, are you? I think that's important, and I'm looking to the NIH to help us uh, expand our work uh, into life course. Okay. Um, the, the start of this mobile health um, cohort, which is essentially uh, the concept, is an echo of the Jackson Heart Study in that the idea is ultimately to take a ubiquitous platform like the cell phone and use that as a, a means of da uh, get data gathering um, and to start as young as we can. So we're starting at 18 with this pilot uh, where, where we hope to enroll our first uh, cohort uh, in a, a big hackathon, ideathon party uh, on November 11th. It's actually a lot more scientific than I just expressed, but <laughs> we are, we are uh, gathering people soon for a pilot and um, with uh, the help of uh, sustaining, sustainable funding of uh, we hope to see it grow and someday scale up to give us big data mm -hmm. that we can use um, um, and hopefully follow people over a long period of time. But in specific answer to your question, we have yet to look um, deep into the younger ages or even uh, prenatally. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I did enjoy your talk as well. Uh, <clears throat> Jerome Flagg from NHLBI. Uh, there are a few social uh, determinants of health that I didn't hear you discuss. Uh, marital status, uh, right. family, uh, cohesiveness, uh, church going, uh, and even yeah. educational level, which may not necessarily equal the uh, uh, right. income. Right. Uh, are you looking at that, and are you finding yeah. differences in the resilient uh, populations right. versus those who are not? Okay, so again, it's still early. So um, the, the individuals... Um, what I gave you um, were data, uh, when it, let's see, I think, I think I showed the slide, of uh, people's self-report of their education. Did I show that? I don't uh, think perhaps so. Perhaps I didn't. Um, yes. In all of these uh, communities, it was interesting, the ones that we selected as being comparable in, in income uh, but having differences in outcome, um, the uh, percentage, this is just categorical stuff, these, the percentage of college-educated individuals is actually quite high. Um, and um, particularly, it was even higher among the people who actually agreed to our interview. So this is one of the challenges of this type of research. So you're getting uh, often the best case scenario, the people who sign up, are not exactly like <laughs> the people who are out yeah, there. Okay, true. they are a very rough approximation. It is a blunt instrument, um, but it begins to uh, set the stage preliminarily for further studies. So, um, I, 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 the point of your question is that uh, more educated, less, I mean, more resilient. Yeah, but not just the education. I'm, I'm thinking also the family cohesiveness, mm -hmm. uh, the right. families that are together as opposed to right. single parents, right. uh, yeah. church going, things uh, that yeah. don't necessarily equate to education probably right. are still quite right. Uh, important. Right. And that's information that we can gather in the individual interviews, and uh, we will do so. Thank but you. I, I agree with you uh, very much that those types of things, and the literature agrees with you too, that those things matter a lot in terms of... Um, you know, people's feelings about their, their, their health overall, their mental um, uh, conditions, their uh, uh, positive affect, and so on. All of those things are, are, are critical. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Dr. Valentine, so yeah. good to see you. Good to see you. It's been wonderful. Thank you for that outstanding talk. Thanks. Could you give us a little glimpse about what you're learning about the genetics and the genomics of uh, health disparities from this mm -hmm. wonderful cohort it's called the Jackson Heart Study? Ah, just okay. The, just, I know there's lots, but there's what's the lots, highlights? And, and you know, I wish we had one of the geneticists here to respond to that question. Um, I think, you know, some interesting things, just to pull um, one thing out, um, and often the genetics of the Jackson Heart Study are, wind up being 
the Jackson Heart Surgery winds up having its data pooled with other uh, uh, cohorts that are smaller. Um, so uh, we were talking earlier today about sickle trait and uh, things like uh, uh, kidney disease and um, uh, coronary disease. So the, the data on kidney disease is, is, seems to be pretty strong that uh, sickle trait does predispose to a slightly higher risk of uh, chronic kidney disease, particularly uh, in the context of uh, blood pressure abnormalities and so forth. Um, the data on coronary disease looks negative. That is, that there's no increased risk from what we see of people being, um, people having sickle trait as determined by genomic analysis um, and the incidence and prevalence of coronary disease. The Jackson Heart Study has participated in a, a lot of consortia that have had some, um, some major, I think, impact on understanding of the, you know, of the human genome, of revising some of the things that we uh, have taken for granted in, in terms of, uh, of what the human genome con consists of or uh, what, what other earlier work has shown us. Um, and I think it'll continue. But to give you the best answer to your question, I need one of my geneticists to, to come and talk. Great. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Dr. Yes. Taylor, thank you for the talk. Kelvin Choi from the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparity. Yes. Um, interested in, in your research, in particular the analysis on the neighborhood characteristics. And yes. I know that you match the median household income of those neighborhoods to select mm -hmm. the res resilience and the, and the at-risk neighborhood. Have you, will you be able to look at how the socioeconomic position of the participant relative to the median household income uh. and see their health outcome? Because, I mean, your talk is about heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. Even within those census tracts, there may be heterogeneity in the socioeconomic position, which can predict their health outcome. Mm -hmm. It's an important point. Um, and um, the increased precision and other aspects of socioeconomic position, you know, being able to make that case, um, a lot of that will depend on uh, the subsequent interviews that we do face to face. Um, but your point is well taken. There is heterogeneity. And until we sort out some of those uh, challenges in the contextual data, we have to be fairly reserved in our conclusions. Uh, I think we'll be able to say uh, things a, a little bit more de definitively. Again, still quite preliminary. This is very exploratory, right? Um, but we'll have some more solid uh, answers when we look at issues of inflammation, uh, oxidative stress, and some of the molecular um, uh, parameters as we continue this study. I, what I really want to emphasize is that we've got to do this. You know, the, the opening sort of salvo in this uh, new effort to understand resilience has to be taken. And I think what we're going to wind up at the end of this study is with a whole bunch of questions. I think there'll be very few answers. But I think our questioning will be more precise and will set the stage for what, what, what we do next. And, and I invite, um, I had my, my uh, email address on one of the slides. I, um, we still have IT. I invite um, these questions, um, and they will be discussed in our meetings. So I, I want to be sure that uh, if you have thoughts or questions about uh, what was presented here or about anything in this topic in general, I, I really would like to hear from you. So it, I'll just tell you, it's H. Taylor, <laughs> uh, at MSM, as in Morehouse School of Medicine, dot edu, H. Taylor, at MSM, dot edu. And I welcome your questions. You, you might put in the subject line, uh, what a uh, lecture series. That would help me uh, know what it's about. So please join me in thanking Dr. Taylor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.